When I saw the very first Guardians Frontline trailer, I felt that this would be a mix of Halo and Titanfall. Now, there is a little bit of both in this for, as far as movement and gameplay are concerned, and we're going to deep dive into every single aspect of this game, including its multiplayer mode. And if you've been here before and you've seen my review of Light Brigade, you know that this is going to be a massive deep dive. That's how all my reviews are here. So remember the name Butter Something when you're looking for a highly detailed review of any VR game that is coming up that you're interested in. That being said, since this is such a long review, I recommend grabbing a snack, a drink, and settling in a comfy place for today's review of Guardians Frontline. The experience that Guardians Frontline has to offer is pretty unique when it comes to the online and solo modes of the game. While the FPS part of the game offers a feeling of Halo and Titanfall, the RTS mode is what makes the gameplay truly unique. Especially when you are on the same battlefield that you're commanding from the skies, you just feel that you are in the battle, but also miles away from that battle trying to tell everybody what to do. So overall, truly unique when it comes to that. This is definitely not the first game to do something along those lines, and it definitely will not be the last. However, this is the first one that I've seen like this in VR. But unfortunately, there are a few issues with that. And we're not going to start with anything bad, but I do want to kind of set the table with that. There are some things that definitely hold this game behind. So let's go in on the overview of the story of Guardians Frontline. The game's story isn't very deep at all, and unfortunately, I think this is something that holds it back majorly. There is an archive that's going to be coming in a later update. I don't know when that update is, and the game is in fact still getting updates. But that is going to be, unfortunately, the only way that we really get any deep lore information on exactly the types of bugs, where they come from, what their role is in their society. So, and unfortunately, it seems like a lot of games are going that way, where they're not really giving you verbal lore anymore that you find a game. It's all in, like, books or some other aspect of the game. So... That's a, a gripe that I have with gaming in general, but let's talk about the story. The overview is pretty much that you are part of a fleet of ships that protects and defends outposts and human mining operations. One day there's an attack on an outpost colony that they can't defend themselves and they've been overrun. After you've completed a few levels within the game, you discover that there is a signal being transmitted by a hive mind to all of the aliens that are telling them what to do. You dissect one of these and pull out the organ, I assume, that is receiving these transmissions and bring it to a scientist that you have to defend their outpost while they try and triangulate this signal. After this signal's been triangulated, you go to the enemy homeworld and you discover a new type of alien that is able to take control of the units that you've placed on the battlefield. This kind of makes it so you have to work smarter in how you've placed your units for defense of your home base, as well as who you kind of have with you. So you don't necessarily want to have a mech with you if it's just you and that's the only other unit you have because you're then going to have to fight a mech if one of these aliens makes it turn against you. Now after you've discovered that they're able to control your technology, you think and you know all the scientists think and believe that they're only able to control the robots, the, the drones, but unfortunately we discovered that we were mistaken and they have turned to mind control on one of our higher ups and force them to essentially allow an infestation of one of our colonies that we have orbiting the planet that we have to take out. And that is the entire story. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any real conclusion here. And again, with the archive really being where we would be getting all of the deep lore, since it's not in the game, we can't really infer too much more of what happened, but that is where the game leaves off. 
it is still being updated. There are still being thing, you know, there are still things being added. But as of right now, you know, the fifth, the fifth, the fourteenth of May, 2023. That is where we were at with this. And again, the story is just so light on detail and pretty much every aspect that it is a massive thing that does hurt the game and if you want to come in here and you just want to shoot stuff great awesome if you don't care about a story perfect get this game you're gonna love it you're gonna have a great time but if you're looking for some sort of story or you know, deep story i should say this is probably something you may want to avoid for the time being Moving on to gameplay and mechanics, like any game we start with the tutorial and the overall introduction to the mechanics we will be using throughout this review. Immediately upon booting up I noticed the detail of the weapons and compared them to something I would see in Halo or like Destiny minus the sights. The futuristic style of the weapons make me feel as this is very early human year, years of human space travel. Uh, not necessarily, you know, where they just started, but they've kind of established Combat themselves within useful. space. No the now, the, the weapons, however, selected. have no weight to them, and they feel as though every area you, you're you on, all the planets, on your ship, all that, just feels like you are in zero gravity. And when it comes to VR, having weight to a weapon impacts the immersion of a lot in my opinion and i understand not everyone's going to agree with that but if a weapon or object feels weightless especially when my character doesn't just fly off when i go in a specific direction that hurts my immersion let's talk about the mechanics you will use while you are in the tutorial the first thing you're going to learn is obviously that you have a weapon now there are definitely different types of weapons in game and we're going to go in depth on those but there's rifles pistols shotguns bows gravity guns swords a lot of things and again we are going to cover that specifically in the weapons part of the video moving on to the movement uh, it's quick it's nice uh, I do really thoroughly enjoy the speed that your character moves when you turn on auto run it's similar to something like Apex or, you know, that one kid running in the hallway like Naruto. That's the speed that you're going at. Now, there's also a jetpack that you'll use in every single game mode, including PvP. But this is not an infinite fly mode. This is more of a jump a far distance. Like, you will pretty much jump the distance of a flea at human scale with this jetpack so it's awesome there's another cool thing that you can do with the jetpack and this is for the people that grew up playing unreal and quake this makes it more akin to strife running if you can learn how to bunny hop with the jetpack movement the other type of movement is teleport and this is not you know, there is a teleport option for movement. I Yes, 100%, you can do that in here. However, there is also podiums that you can teleport to that make the difference. And this helps when you want to travel to a further distance on the map and get some sort of bird's eye view. There also is a teleporter unit that you'll be able to build. And we'll discuss that in the... Um, units part of the video but you will do need those four bigger maps let's move on to the second most used mechanic this is the tablet this is going to be your field command panel where you spawn new units repair units as well as command units this is the introduction of the rts element of guardians frontline and i think that this personally has changed my mind a little bit on RTS. It gave me a little bit of a better understanding and I can probably enjoy them, enjoy them a little bit more, but I am not a big RTS person. I have watched RTS and I understand kind of R, you know, RTS, 
but I feel like it's just so in depth when it comes to the amount of time that RTS can take. So for me, I'm not really big on the RTS element of the game, but it was fun, it was enjoyable, it was easy to use and intuitive. Now, that being said, if you're someone that really enjoys RTS thoroughly, I would not recommend this game if you are big on, I guess, PvP, really in-depth RTS. Now, if you're someone that wants to punish others, you can do a custom map where you build your own map and then other people have to play through it. Or, you know, you could even punish yourself with it. So, moving on to the units that you're going to be able to command, Let's start with the most basic unit, which is the combat droid. This reminds me of an assassin droid in Star Wars, except everything that an assassin droid is good at, this is horrible at. Unfortunately, a lot of the AI is not necessarily great when it comes to prioritizing its targets. What will happen a lot is I will have my home base being attacked, you know, the main objective being attacked, and they will just go ahead and decide that it is more important to get the unit that's closest to them rather than taking priority on what is going to essentially be a fail mission. So this isn't just these units, it's every single unit has this AI issue. So whenever you have a droid, in the beginning, I think it's better to use those to follow you rather than to have them defend anything specific. Now, I want to move on to two units that are kind of together because they do seem to pretty much fit in the same category. Let's start with the anti-air. This unit shoots rockets that will track targets. So when they are airborne, they will track the target. They are unable to shoot anything on the ground while the cannon can actually do both. The anti-air will do more damage to airborne units. However, since the cannon does both, I usually just get the cannon and upgrade either its range, its damage output, or its fire rate. Just because it can do both, I know that the anti-air does a little bit more damage, but I think it's kind of just a redundant unit. However, I will say that I appreciate the variety that they've taken just to make things a little bit more interesting. And I found that using anti-air was probably better on the point you have to defend rather than putting it anywhere out and about, personally. Now that we've gone through everything that we start unlocked, let's get to the first locked unit. This is the drone, which in my opinion replaces everything. And when I say everything, I more or less mean cannons and combat droids. Just because I can have this follow me for escort missions, but I can also have this sit and defend or patrol a point that will constantly be bombarded. The next piece that you unlock is the teleporter. This, as you saw earlier in the video, is a very important piece of equipment because it la allows you to traverse across the map a lot quicker. And as you've seen, not all maps have a very massive amount of teleport sites. So this allows you to build a portable teleport site so that when you do get in a pickle, you can either get away fast or get to an objective really fast. The next unit that you unlock is the mech now there are two different mechs in the game there's one that's ai controlled and there's one that is physically manned by you you are able to turn your ai controlled unit into a player controlled unit however you need to unlock the next unit to be able to do that which is the armory you will need to research the ability to man the mech and then you will be able to drive it. The armory just doesn't research how to man mechs as well. It researches the uh, enemy grenades, which pretty much make it so that they, they become friendlies. It researches extra damage. It researches uh, more health. 
there's definitely a lot of things in it that make it worth it. However, you do have to place it and it does take time for those upgrades to be unlocked. The very last unlock is the armory. However, there is one unit before that that you unlock and that is the tank. This is an unmanned vehicle which with the armory can also be made to barrage or bombard a area. Now, whenever you upgrade the tank to be able to bombard an area, it is no longer mobile. It becomes a stationary unit. So do make sure you have it somewhere where you want it because you are not going to be able to move it again. It's more of a mortar rather than a tank at that point. Now, this is not a unit. You can't spawn these, but this is definitely the part where I want to talk about it. And this is the vehicles. Currently, there is only one vehicle in the game. There is a second one planned coming soon since the game is still in development. But this is pretty much the Pelican from Halo for all intents and purposes. You get to fly a Pelican and it is amazing. This is only on specific maps. This is not something that you can get airdrop to you but it also has the ability to be put on custom maps. This is something that I always wanted to do as a kid was fly a pelican and this kind of gave me that feel of it. I will say that the flying is a little bit confusing at first, but when you get the hang of it, it is freaking amazing. And honestly, I've felt like this was kind of out of left field as it is the only actual vehicle you see in the game that you can fly and it's completely random. You just get it on one of the levels. So very unexpected, but honestly, I'm very happy that it was something that I discovered. There are six different game types, not including the PVP mode. Survival is also a game type. However, that is just the tutorial. So it is semi irrelevant and Let's start by talking about the defend game mode. This is exactly what you believe the name to be and you are defending. However, this is more of a central point that you will be defending and you will have waves of enemies come at you until you are essentially picked up by your transport. For this, more than likely you're gonna have to use just about everything you can on these harder levels, but you should be able to manage it isn't necessarily that hard to do solo like some other game modes protect is kind of like the bomb game mode in team fortress where you have to escort the bomb to the other side of the map the difference is your mining drone moves which during each individual checkpoint you need to protect while it's mining and the mining transport before you can move needs to be done mining that site this game mode is more consistent moving that will have you build up your army to actually travel with you for maximum survivability until the very end where you need to extract all of that off the planet and you're held up in one stationary spot. Now, let me add <laughs> that on insane difficulty on solo, this is interesting. It can be very easy or it can be very hard. It all depends on which protect mission you are doing. The next game type is elimination. You'll need to go to a predetermined area and take out nests while you defend a small area or base rather than an open map. So this mode is easier than most and can be pretty quick to finish just because you have e individual stages that you need to defend rather than either going and dominating an entire map or going out and having to protect some sort of mining drone. Now, escort will sound very similar to protect, which is essentially the same kind of thing you are protecting a mining drone however in protect the mining drone moves a lot faster but you spend a lot more time at a checkpoint while in escort the mining drone moves a lot slower but you spend less time sitting in one place those are the very 
basic differences of these two game modes. Both of them, you still have to protect the mining drone. Now, keep in mind when I talk about Domination, which is my favorite game mode, this review is coming from a solo player. So, when I say that it is a harder game mode, it definitely is, but I still enjoy it. Now, Domination requires you to hold multiple points on the map, and after you've held all those points at the same time, you need to continue to hold them for two minutes straight without losing them. Now, these points can be across the map. There are some massive maps out there, which those teleporters that we talked about earlier, that's when this really comes in handy because you can traverse around the map a lot quicker in case you start losing a point. Now, if you started with point A and then lost that, as long as you have another point, you can still keep going. But if you lose all your points, you have to restart and do the whole thing over again. That being said, probably one of the funnest game modes, even though it is one of the harder game modes. The very last game mode we're going to talk about today is Conquer. This is probably my favorite game mode as it requires a lot of strategy, and in my opinion is definitely the hardest game mode type. The objective is to eliminate all the enemy nests while protecting your own home base. Now, there is really only one way you can play this. You have to go out and take care of the nests yourself, now, when you do this, you need to have enough units defending your home base and enough to help you take out those nests. Usually, I would take care of the nests myself as I really enjoy running around and using the jetpack for faster movement. Then this pretty much ensured I had enough units early on to defend since I would go out solo. Now, this is not elimination. This takes up the whole map. It's not just tiny parts of it. You need to make sure you have teleporters set up because you are going to be traversing across this entire map multiple times. And unfortunately, you're not really punished for dying. It's not like it takes any of your money or anything like that. It's just a timer of respawn. So you can be as stupid as you want to essentially run around and die a hundred times if you really want to, as long as you don't lose your base. Now that we finished the game modes, let's go ahead and talk about the 12 different weapons in Guardians Frontline. But before we do that, I want to talk about one thing that is super unique to the weapons on here and that is reversible charging handles. So usually when I'm playing any sort of game, most charging handles are on the right side of the weapon. Unfortunately, I am right-handed, so I can't use easily accessible charging handles with my left hand. I have to turn my gun 90 degrees usually and then pull the charge handle. In Guardian's Frontline, I don't have to do that. If I hold the weapon in my right hand, the charge handle automatically switches to the left side of the gun. If I hold the weapon in my left hand, the charge handle moves to the right side of the weapon. Very cool, very unique. I think if anybody is making a sci-fi game that isn't hyper-realistic milsim for VR, I think they should definitely be implementing this feature. Now let's move on to our first weapon, which is the AK-2. This is the pistol and you'll notice that there is no true iron sights in this game. However, red dots work fine. Unfortunately, not all weapons have red dots, and without weapon customization, there's no real way to attach one. The AK-2 reminds me of the Spartan Pistol from Halo with a mix of the Smart Pistol from Titanfall. And overall, after you unlock new weapons, you usually don't really touch this weapon again, but you can upgrade its damage output, which makes it useful later down the line if you really want to use a pistol. The next weapon is the AK-5. This is the standard assault rifle, and this is more of a short to medium range weapon, and the only reason you can't really use it long range is because the bullets seem to despawn, as far as I can tell. So, the AK-5 is pretty good when it comes to the amount of rounds, and pulling the charge handle feels very good, and for me, it gives me more of that cod advanced warfare kind of vibe rather than something from halo or apex 
The AK-9 is a rocket launcher that you're able to unlock. It does have five shots and will run out of those five shots unless you do the research to upgrade it so it will reload after a certain amount of time. Now, visually, this gun looks amazing. It's very, very true to what I would say is a futuristic take on a rocket launcher. And whenever you need to get out of a sticky situation, you can pretty much jetpack up and shoot down and you are good to go. Probably the most useless weapon in Guardians Frontier is the KL-228, which is the shotgun. Visually, it looks good, but I just didn't use it because it didn't feel like it was a necessity to use when it came to comparing it to every other weapon in the game. The grenades in the game, I also felt like I could take them or leave them just because everything seemed to do an acceptable amount of damage. And if I want it crowd control, why am I going to use a grenade when I can just use my rocket launcher? Now, I am a very big bow guy, and the plasma bow is amazing. For someone that enjoys bows, this is probably going to be one of your favorite weapons. However, it is also the only weapon in the entire game that has projectile drop. The sniper does it, none of it. This is the only one, and it is considered, in my eyes, a weapon of skill rather than a weapon of ease. And it is pretty strong for what it is. So if you're someone that likes a bow and bow was your way to play, you know, Elder Scrolls games, the plasma bow is definitely going to be the way to go if you enjoy that bow playstyle. The next weapon is the gravity gun, and this allows you to throw enemies across the map, which is hilariously funny. And as a solo play player, it's probably not the best option to use, but with just how funny it is to throw bugs and, and creatures across the map, it's one of those things that you kind of have to use. And this visually looks like a mix between the gravity gun from Half-Life and the portal gun from Portal. However, this does not work on large enemies as well as flying enemies. It does not work on either of those. It only works on ground enemies. And they cannot be large. It's just the regular ones and like the blow up bugs. Now, the next weapon is the energy blade. This is pretty much a lightsaber for all intents and purposes. And it will one hit enemies as long as they are not the massive, you know, the big variants of those enemies. Unfortunately, since it's a weapon, I have to cover it, but the flamethrower is absolutely atrocious. No one should be using this. The canister for the fuel is way too small. You have to be irredeemably close and overall is just a negative 10 out of 10 when it comes to a weapon in this game. Now, the sniper rifle, on the other hand, is the most amazing piece of work in Guardian's Frontier. And I have to be honest and say, I was blown away by how this scope was implemented. It makes me feel like I'm using a Halo or Destiny sniper, and the scope itself works like a monitor rather than an enclosed site. So the only place I have ever seen this used other than Guardian's Frontline is Rec Room Paintball. I think most scopes in VR, unless it is a realistic milsim, probably should implement something like this. And I'm just blown away by Virtual Age and what they did with this sniper rifle. And I think this is the best weapon in the entire game, visually, feel-wise, as well as implementation as a whole. Unfortunately, the machine gun is everything it needs to be, but that weightless feel on the weapons feels like on this that the weapon doesn't really have any power. Now, don't get me wrong, the weapon itself is very powerful. However, with a lack of recoil and just overall oomph, if that makes sense, it has a lackluster feel to it when you are using it, and really ruins the immersiveness of using a machine gun. 
Our last weapon is the TARDIS of all weapons. The reason I say that is because the bullet magazine carries 71 bullets. And you see how small this magazine is, do you not? How is 71 bullets going in there, but only 39 are going in the assault rifle? This is the AK-4, and I call it the Zero Sense submachine gun because that is what it is. It makes zero sense. The recoil is insanely low and the bullet amount is just weird. It is what I would consider black hole magazine technology. While level design in an RTS FPS is probably not one of the most important things, it definitely, to me, is something that is pretty high up on the list. And I think Guardians Frontline does a good job. Every map is pretty unique when it comes to visuals. Game modes can only do so much. So if you have an escort mission or a domination, when it comes to game modes, that's what really holds the maps back. I don't feel that the devs held themselves back in the uniqueness that they tried to put into every single map. I think more or less the game modes really held back the ability to have such unique level design. But again, what it lacks in massively unique detail it makes up for in the gameplay as well as the overall believability of each map. Just like the level design, I find the enemy design honestly lacking a bit. Now there is a few unique enemy types and visually, and I'm gonna say this up front, visually, Every enemy is amazing. They did a great job of differentiating what you're going to kind of be going up against from a distance. They have like these spider type things, which are super cool visually. They have the scorpions, the dragons, the krakens. The, the big scorpion, the dragon, and the kraken are super unique. Very rare that you're going to see them. And unfortunately, when you do see them, they're pretty much just as easy as any other enemy as far as I'm concerned when it comes to the difficulty that I experienced as a solo player. So yeah, they take an, maybe an additional clip of ammo, but really what's an additional three seconds of DPS, really? So unfortunately when it comes to making encounters with these unique, they kind of miss the mark when it comes to that. The most unique thing that I saw was at the very end when there were two different types of enemies. There was a tentacle and there was a kind of dragonfly looking enemy that would make my turrets and my units turn on me. And those were like the two most unique things that I saw, not visually, but damage and unexpectedness of how they you know, would work is more or less what I'm saying. So that being said, all the designs for the enemies are simple. I kind of put that on the quest too, but overall all designs when it comes to visuals are unique and I will give them that. Now the gameplay loop itself entirely, unless you're a completionist is pretty shallow. There's leaderboards for each level if you really want to unlock those and try and be number one. There's also character skins as well as ship decals, which take not in-game currency. I don't want to call it that because it sounds like it's a, uh, you know, something you have to buy. You don't. It's just this, the currency that you earn in the game. Um, and the only other thing is research points, which is upgrading like your field equipment for co-op and PvP. Now... When I talk about PvP, unfortunately, I've only ever played, like, two games. And I think PvP is really where this gameplay loop shines. Unfortunately, people are not really playing PvP. This is more of a co-op game 
and a co-op community when it comes to playing Guardians Frontline. It seems like this is kind of going the way of Fallout 76 where everyone's here to help each other rather than play against each other. But the PvP experience, playing that first person and RTS at the same time in a live environment against other players is just super amazing. It's a 2v2 PvP scene and it's more of, you know, your teammate commands their own units, you command your own, and then the enemy team commands their own individually. And they work, you know, kind of work together to take over the map, because I've only played the domination mode. But I was just blown away by how amazingly unique this type of game can be when it comes to PvP with that first-person shooter capability. I don't play games like this, so please keep that in mind. If there are games out there like that, I haven't played them, and for me it may just be that it's in VR and that's why it's so cool and I wouldn't like it on flat screen potentially. So do keep that in mind when I talk about this and take that with a grain of salt as these are not usually games that I play. Let's move into the accessibility aspect of Guardians Frontline. Now, for me, I'm not someone that needs accessibility settings, but I do have a lot of friends that do need accessibility settings, and that's why I always cover these in my review, because I want to make sure that if you're someone that needs specific options, that you're informed and well enough to feel confident in the purchase that you've made, just because I've had friends that have had bad experiences in the past without having specific accessibility options. So just to start off, you can play this seated, it doesn't matter, as well as another very cool mechanic that I discovered in the tutorial is you have the ability to just drop your weapons and they'll teleport right back to the slot that you have them on. And the biggest thing about that is there are a lot of games where you drop your gun on the ground and you can't pick it back up because maybe you can't bend over and it never comes back to you and you're not able to get that weapon back. This teleports right back to the slot that you have put it in, and it makes it so that you never have to worry about grabbing it. Another cool thing that I mentioned earlier was the charge handles and how it changes sides when, you know, you have it in a particular hand. So it, maybe you don't have motion in your entire right arm, but you can use your hand. You know, you can use the controller left-handed and actually still be able to charge it relatively easily with your you know your right hand the other cool thing is they provide multiple ways of reloading you can either do it manually which does give you double damage or you can do it where you just point it at the ground and it reloads itself automatically you, know, you don't get the two point you know two time damage bonus Commander, but it is cool we were hit by it's nice to have that we you know the if there are people that don't have, have a second hand and they can't reload at least they can still play move around and all that good stuff another thing and a lot of people still do get motion sick in vr this does offer a tunnel vision feature that you will not have to worry about getting sick in because it does tunnel down and kind of block out that peripheral vision, which is good for those people that are prone to motion sickness. One more very cool feature that I think probably needs to be in most games when it comes to non-realistic situations is the ability to move your slots. In Guardians Frontline, you can move every single weapon slot that you want. If you can't reach behind you, you can move that weapon slot to the front of you so you can actually visually see it. Or, if you want, you can press the X button, I believe it is, and it will automatically pull up your weapons. Sorry, it is not the X button. It is the B button. That will pull up all your weapons in a menu in front of you so you can still choose different weapons and don't have to worry about reaching you know, behind you to your back if you have mobility issues. Well, overall, I think the game itself is something that you more than likely should probably just play with friends. You and three others playing on the hardest difficulty on custom maps can just be fun. 
as well as giving you the experience to experience that PvP. The solo experience to me leaves much to be desired with a lack of deep story and it feels more akin to a string of shooting stuff just because that is the mission you are there to complete. It does not feel like you have any amazing reason you're on any planet or doing anything specific other than you just love killing. And for me, unless you're a massive RTS fan that will play any game just because it has RTS elements, then it's a solid average solo experience. But playing with others is really where the game truly shines and will allow you to experience the thrill of 360 no scoping bugs with friends and just going head to head with your armies in PvP. My thoughts are Guardian Frontier is a game you should play with friends and skip if you're a solo player looking for any sort of longevity or PvP. If you are a solo player that loves co-op, then I say it's worth it for someone like that just because the community is very co-op focused. Now, for anyone that's made it f this far in the review, my name is Butter Something. I want to thank all of you that took your time to watch this review. This is how all of my reviews are pretty much going to be on the channel, unless it's something that is just small and not very in-depth at all. But this is how I believe reviews should be. And if you think reviews should be this in-depth, I would encourage you to subscribe and like the video because this is what I enjoy doing, breaking every tiny detail down to ensure that a consumer has gotten the absolute best deal and best match for them. That being said, my name is Butter Something. I want to thank you all for watching, and for more gameplay, news, guides, and reviews, make sure to subscribe to the channel and leave a like. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment below, and I'll do my best to answer those.